Welcome to our Telecom Interface Testing Webinar. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is being given by MET Laboratories. MET is a leader in the testing of electrical and electronic equipment for environmental hardiness, product safety, and electromagnetic compatibility. MET operates world-class labs in Baltimore, Maryland, Santa Clara and Union City, California, Austin, Texas, and also runs operations in China, Taiwan, Korea, and Italy. This webinar will run about 45 minutes with an, an additional 15 minutes for questions and answers. Due to the number of registrants, all attendees will have their phones muted. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your control panel. We will attempt to answer all questions at the end. If you're having technical difficulties, you can contact us the same way or call us at 410-935-6053. That's 410-935-6053. Today's webinar is being presented by Jim Reed and Camillo Obana. Jim is Telecom Lab Manager here at MET, and Camillo is EMC and Telecom Technical Manager here at MET Labs. At this point, I will hand over the presentation to Jim. Hello, as Barnaby just uh, mentioned, my name is uh, Jim Reed. I'm the uh, Telecom Lab Manager here in the uh, Baltimore office at MET Laboratories. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started with this uh, presentation for telecom uh, interface testing and applicable requirements. OK, so uh, briefly, the agenda, we want to uh, focus on uh, a broad overview of, of telecom interfaces and the <coughs> Uh, as well as some customer-driven type testing. Occasionally, uh, uh, a buyer will have additional requirements that go beyond what uh, regulatory requirements uh, demand. So the overview will be um, for, again, both the uh, U.S. market and the international market. Uh, so here we're, we're seeing the uh, various telecom type interfaces that we'll be uh, addressing. Uh, digital, analog, uh, T1, uh, XDSLs, all flavors of DSL really, uh, as well as the uh, optical testing uh, for both the uh, U.S. and, and international requirements. Uh, this presentation will be really focused more on the uh, commonly failed uh, test uh, that we see here in our laboratory. So a list of the uh, standards that we're, we're going to be looking at here for the uh, USA, Canada, and, and some of Europe uh, for those ITU specifications you see there, the uh, International Telecommunication Union requirements. Uh, for the USA, uh, we will start out with talking about GR1089 core, which is a part of the uh, NED the network equipment building systems um, criteria required when uh, you're selling to a utility in the U.S. Uh, Canada also accepts a lot of that testing as well. Uh, so we'll get into that. Uh, GR295 core, another Telcordia standard uh, that we uh, test here and evaluate to. That is really not so much interface or telecom interface uh, criteria. It's more for bonding networks, for isolated bonding networks. But that is part of what's evaluated along with the GR1089. Uh, ACTA requirements, 
the uh, Administrative Council for Terminal Attachments. It's the old Part 68 program uh, from the FCC uh, set of criteria, Code of Fed Federal Regulations. And that testing is uh, all now mostly all contained within a TIA document, TIA 968. So that will have all of your uh, ports requirements in there. The FCC also uh, maintains uh, requirements for disabilities, hearing aid compatibility, uh, receive objective loudness rating uh, type uh, requirements for handsets, uh, both digital, uh, voice over IP, as well as analog handsets. Uh, Industry Canada CSO3, that is uh, very closely harmonized with uh, the, the Part 68 criteria. There are some slight differences, but we'll, we'll go ahead and mention some of those as well. Uh, that, uh, that set of criteria for CSO3 is also for uh, telecommunication equipment ports. And those, the, both the ACTA, TIA 968, as well as the CSO3 for Canada, are for end user equipment. It's really more harms to the network uh, type criteria so that uh, non-utility owned or non-carrier owned uh, property that is uh, owned by the end user and connected to the tele telecom networks, uh, when that happens, those standards make sure that there are no harm uh, to the networks coming from that equipment. Then we have a, a series of IQT specifications, K.20, .21, 44, and 45. Those, that set of criteria there, those standards are really, uh, are very similar to the GR1089 core set of criteria uh, for telecommunication centers uh, in, in uh, Europe. So if you've got equipment that's going to be installed at a central office or a telecommunication center in Europe, then you're going to need to make sure that uh, the product itself uh, meets the requirements out of those standards. And then we have a GR253 core uh, for sonnet and optical uh, testing. Now, it's important to note, too, that MET Labs does all of this testing in-house. We're, we're capable of running all these tests uh, on site here in our Baltimore office. So getting down into more detail uh, here, the, the critical test again out of GR1089 core uh, for those types of telecom ports that you see there. And we also have Ethernet uh, requirements for what's termed as intra-building uh, type ports, uh, ports that do not have a metallic connection to outside plant and are not uh, traditionally telephony ports or telecom ports, but they're very much uh, closely associated. Uh, balanced ports and with respect to uh, earth ground. So there are requirements in GR1089 uh, as, as it relates to qualifying the, uh, the interface ports. Uh, and you have both lightning surge simulations and AC power fault uh, test uh, criteria. Uh, the lightning surge is fairly self-explanatory. It's uh, uh, pulse of energy that's applied directly metallically to the uh, telecom ports. And there are several different levels there, depending on the uh, application of that port. Uh, and again, these are utility requirements. So this is going to be uh, performed on equipment that's owned by uh, you know, a Verizon or an AT&T and installed in their central offices, or even at the customer premise location. Again, uh, the equipment would be owned by the utility. There are first and second level criteria. So mostly what we're going to cover here are first level criteria. Uh, from this document, it, it determines first level criteria needs to, um, the equipment needs to operate, continue to operate after receiving these events and not be damaged in any way. Uh, second level criteria is more hazardous in terms of the energy that you're applying to the ports, uh, but the pass-fail criteria is a bit more relaxed uh, so that the equipment does not necessarily need to operate afterward, um, but needs to fail safely. If, a, if you send a high-level lightning surge or an AC power fault, 
into these ports, you want to make sure that uh, first level criteria is not damaged and it continues to operate uh, before and after the event. Uh, with second level criteria, the port can be damaged, but you need to make sure that uh, you fail safely. No fire, no fragmentation, no electrical safety uh, type hazard. So in terms of pass-fail, the first level criteria is a little more um, problematic. We see more failures there uh, in the lab, and it's because we'll see damage or, or equipment not operating properly afterwards. And typical uh, failures are, are, are caused by protection, um, a set actor or some sort of transorb across the uh, telecom conductors, uh, for instance, is not rated uh, adequate for that uh, type of surge event or a power fault event. Power fault meaning that's an AC uh, RMS voltage and current that's being applied to those lines and that's really simulating uh, an event where uh, commercial AC power comes in contact with mostly outside plant type cabling and you're looking at how that affects the equipment back at the uh, central office for example. Uh, so the fixes are fairly straightforward. Replacing the protection is you know, and rating that properly for those events is typically something that's going to uh, handle the, the problem, the failure. Uh, occasionally we'll see trace widths is another example where, where we'll have trace. Trace is not uh, spaced properly and you may have some arcing in between those uh, conductors on the board and that can be a little more problematic and cause uh, the need for board respins. So, uh, as far as the telecom ports go, there are eight, essentially eight types or classifications out of GR1089. And I know this, this slide's a bit busy here, but the type is what you uh, want to focus on there. The type one is for uh, central office locations uh, of, of the equipment. And uh, there are different criteria that's applied to these different types of ports. So you may have a, a piece of equipment that has a T1 port that goes to outside plant and Ethernet ports that stay inside the confines of the building and are subjected to much uh, lower level uh, lightning surge simulations, for example. Uh, so type, type 1 port is uh, central office located and has metallic connections to outside plant. Uh, type 2, a central office location and an intra-building type port, such as an Ethernet, for example. Uh, type 3 uh, is, is similar to Type 1. You're located, however, at the customer premise. So again, this is utility-owned equipment, but it may be in a, you know, a telephone closet in a building, for example, owned by the utility, but the location is at the customer premise. And uh, the port on that equipment would have an outside uh, plant connection, a metallic path to the outside confines of the building. Uh, and there are some different uh, levels there, type 3A, type 5A, uh, really for short reach uh, type cables or um, cellular sites where you know, equipment may be exposed to the outside plant, but it's not running for a very long distance and it's staying on site. Uh, type 4 uh, through 8, as you see here, type 4 is uh, generally speaking, uh, customer premise located equipment uh, that has no connection to the outside plant. Uh, and again, 4A, there's a, a breakout there for uh, optical network terminals or, or NIDs. Um, type 5 is for outside plant uh, type ports where the, uh, the unit itself is located at, in a pedestal or a cabinet that's outside, totally exposed to the envi outside environment and not within the confines of a building. There are criteria under type 6 for antenna ports, type 7 AC power ports, and type 8, 8A and 8B for DC power uh, ports. Now, you know, most of the equipment that's being sold to the utilities is going to be minus 48 volt DC power and those criteria there. So the connections to the ports when you're running your lightning surge or AC power port simulations uh, are shown here. Uh, they're both differential and common mode. Uh, 
uh, configuration where you're applying to tip ring, tip one, ring one type combinations. <clears throat> Here uh, we're looking at a table, and this is taken directly out of our, our GA 1089 core standard uh, that can be purchased on the Telcordia website. Uh, that uh, is showing our first level outside plant lightning surge. Uh, just, just some examples of some of the uh, surge events. If you have an outside plant port, an uh, analog port, or a you know, T1 port is an example that would leave the confines of the building. Uh, these types of surges, depending on the port type there in the second column on the left, uh, you, would, you would apply these surges to the, uh, to the product under test. And just continuing on with that first level table. So uh, most of what we see here as far as more problematic would probably be uh, the the uh, surge number four and possibly surge number two in the previous slide. Uh, that's where we'll see uh, the most issues with damage or the uh, port, be, again, being damaged in some way and not passing traffic effectively. Uh, so these th that would be a failure for a first level type test under GR1089 core. Here are the intra-building lightning surge. Uh, simulations. Now these are the types of uh, events that would be applied to an Ethernet port or a, a port, a, a balanced port that would not leave the confines of the building that would however leave the confines of the cabinet or the frame that it's installed in. Uh, here is, uh, we also have differential and common mode type events. Now at one time uh, as far as the testing that we're performing now, at one time the, these events for type 4 ports that you're seeing here would only be applied in a differential mode. And now we're applying these, uh, I'm sorry, in a common, common type mode. Now we're seeing them also applied in a differential mode. And that's causing some uh, grief with uh, folks uh, coming through the lab because uh, we're, we're seeing some failures with Ethernet ports that are not typically very well protected for lightning surge simulations. They're able to, to survive the common mode test, but not so much the differential mode. That, was a, that became an effective requirement as of August 1st of this year. And we're moving in here to our AC power faults again, uh, simulating some level of commercial power uh, in, in the event of a, a storm situation, something like that. Uh, some sort of fault condition where that AC commercial power actually comes in contact with uh, outside plant uh, telecom ports. Uh, these are first level uh, surges here, uh, first level events. And I'll throw our second level uh, AC power fault criteria in here as well. Uh, now for the second level, again, you, you can be damaged but you have to fail safely. So we can't have any kind of fire or fragmentation. There have been several instances where we have seen ports flame up with this type of testing, um, particularly under the uh, surge test number two there, where you've got 425 volts RMS at 440 amps uh, short circuit current being applied to those ports. Okay, so that we'll move on to the uh, ITU uh, testing for telecom centers. Again, very similar uh, to the GR1089 set of criteria. Uh, lots of uh, test surges and um, power faults within that uh, set of documents that would be uh, required for any of the ports on the equipment. Uh, such as E1 or any DSL or POTS type ports, uh, as well as coaxial type ports. <clears throat> there, uh, again, they have essentially two uh, types of lightning surges, the outside plant surges and also intra-building 
type surges that are applied depending on the applicability of the port and how it's used. Uh, this criteria, K.20 has criteria for the uh, actual telecom center, uh, very similar to the uh, central office here in the United States. Uh, K.21 has the criteria for customer premise uh, located equipment. K.44 has, uh, is really a cross-reference because the K.20 and 21 will refer to uh, test setups uh, in K.44 and also K.44 has many um, definitions that will define what those other uh, two standards are referring to. Uh, so it's a good cross-reference there for that and, and it's necessary to be able to evaluate all three of those at the same time. Uh, K.45 is really more for uh, trunks and access uh, points between, say, telecom centers and the uh, customer premise side. So very similar lightning surge and, and power cross testing uh, involved in those standards, but, um, but only on the trunk side of the, uh, of, of the network. And again, the common failure is very much like the uh, GR1089. Usually protection is, is a, the problem, uh, and with some proper rating of the protection, uh, you know, if you have problems going, during the course of the testing, uh, then we can go ahead and help you get that fixed, um, usually right here in the lab. So the uh, ITU standards also define the port types. You see there the, uh, the four columns to the right. Uh, the symmetric port would be your balanced port above ground, your T1, your pods, uh, coaxial port requirements, uh, a power port and a mains port uh, set of criteria. And this is just an example really of what's out of the uh, K.20 uh, standard. They're, they're written all very, very similarly, but uh, depending on the port type, that will go ahead and, and define which tests and which setups need to be applied to those particular ports as you run through the uh, criterion and standard. So this uh, would then be a table that would be for the external symmetric uh, pair cabling uh, ports on the equipment. And this is for, happens to be for the outside plant lightning surge uh, simulations. You see basic level tests and enhanced level tests. If you have uh, equipment that's more um, located in a more exposed area, maybe uh, like a Type 5 out of GR1089 where you'd have uh, something in an outside plant cabinet, that would be considered a higher, higher level exposure. And uh, consequently, you'll have, generally speaking, higher level uh, energy tests that are applied to those particular ports because of the uh, installation that, that's required. Okay, moving on into the, uh, the regulatory type testing for the TIA 968B. Uh, these tests are now actual requirements for end user equipment. So this is non-utility owned equipment and there are, depending on the type of port, there are several different types of tests that are required. Uh, here we are listing the uh, T1 digital port. Uh, and some of the tests that, that we'd be performing there, the output power testing, uh, you're looking at pulse shape testing, uh, rate testing, clock accuracy, uh, leakage current tests, which are, uh, you know, a dielectric test that's performed on the equipment itself, but also takes into account uh, the telecom ports and the various uh, even non-telecom ports that are on the equipment and you're looking to make sure that you have a certain dielectric strength between those ports and, say, exposed conductive surface or grounding points on the equipment. So just some of the failures here that we see for the uh, digital T1 ports. Um, clocks drifting are not accurate, so your, your pulse rate is not uh, proper and does not fall within the spec outlined in the standard. Uh, the EUT not functioning properly, balance uh, being an issue at times. Uh, many of these uh, tests are, are uh, easily fixed with uh, 
either software, or firmware revisions, and uh, occasionally some hardware uh, adjustments. Uh, transverse balance, just simply showing the uh, limitation table here. And this is the same uh, set of limits that, that are used for both digital and analog uh, equipment, uh, by the way. So here you're looking at uh, the balance of the conductors with respect to ground. If you have uh, you know, just a two-wire port, for example, and you have a, an imbalance with the tip side, one of the conductors toward ground, that will show up in the uh, transverse balance testing and you won't be able to have a high enough uh, level of balance to, to comply with that particular criteria. Here just a, showing a, a sample of the pulse mass uh, for a T1 pulse. Uh, generally speaking, we're on a, a one mark and, and seven zero pattern to go ahead and uh, normalize your pulse within this, uh, within this particular template fairly straightforward stuff. Uh, you do have, uh, this is just showing the uh, zero dB line build out, uh, what's termed as option A in the TIA standard, uh, very similar to with Industry Canada as far as the terminology and the testing that's, that's used. But there are three different uh, pulse templates that uh, you're required to meet depending on the line build out there for zero, minus 7.5, or minus 15 dB line build out. That's pretty much it for the digital. The analog uh, terminal equipment uh, ports, uh, got the, again, all flavors of DSL really, the XDSL, we'll just call it, uh, as well as the uh, plain old telephone service type ports, the analog POTS ports. Uh, there are surge tests involved with that as, as well, with with both digital and analog, actually, as well as uh, signal power impedance to that's presented toward the network when these uh, devices are installed in your home or your office, for example. Again, these are not utility-owned properties, so these requirements are going to actually qualify that type of system uh, to so that you're able to market it within the U.S. or Canada. <coughs> Common failures, uh, you know, the surge, the lightning surge simulations causing um, the equipment to not operate or, or um, cause other compliance areas to fail after receiving those lightning surge simulations. Uh, again, normally it's just a question of not having the protection across the uh, port adequately uh, rated. Uh, noise occasionally. Uh, for the, from the analog uh, line. Uh, generally speaking, you'll see that at times after the lightning surge simulations are applied. Uh, many times the signal power, as far as the, the, the signal power testing that we do perform on the uh, analog equipment, the, what they term in-band uh, from 100 hertz to 4 kilohertz will actually be compliant, but the failures are typically in the out of band, anything higher than that, up to uh, 30 megahertz range, because the uh, the limits there are much more uh, stringent. Other than the, uh, if you're DSL, of course, you're operating in those higher ranges. <coughs> so here's just a, an example of you know lightning surge, a potential lightning surge uh, generator setup. Uh, we use off-the-shelf equipment, but uh, if you were so inclined, you could build a, a lightning surge uh, simulator. The wave forms coming out of the uh, surge generator need to be qualified before the testing, so you're qualifying both the open circuit waveform uh, and the short circuit current waveform uh, to meet the uh, peak uh, high positive going and negative going. Uh, voltage and uh, timing there for the rise and fall times, as well as the uh, short circuit current uh, that's available from your test generator. Same thing, you're qualifying that for uh, rise time and fall time, but you're looking at the short circuit current. That's all qualified prior to applying those surges to the uh, various ports. And just some of the examples of the uh, analog uh, 
this would be more out of band, uh, above four kilohertz uh, signal power limitations. So generally speaking, if we're going to see a failure in the lab, many times we'll see that in the higher range, say that 90 kilohertz to 266 kilohertz range up in that top table, third line. Both uh, metallic and longitudinal uh, signal powers are, are measured. Just showing an example of transverse balance set up here. This, this is something that very similar we've been used for uh, both the analog and the uh, digital testing as well as the uh, DSL type tests. Uh, the change would be the references uh, that you'll see there for resistance and uh, some of the uh, capacitance, but the, the general circuit design is, is nearly identical. Uh, and again, just the uh, transverse balance limitations. Uh, for the DSL uh, type evaluations, you'll, other than the uh, signal power test that you'll see in band, because it's really still considered analog equipment, uh, there will also be a power spectral density uh, measurements that are, are performed on the equipment. And we're only looking at the, uh, the ATUR equipment. We're not looking at the... Um, the DSLAMs or the, or the carrier side equipment. This is only the equipment that would be installed uh, and operated on the uh, customer side of the uh, network. The criteria for the uh, equipment in the central office goes beyond this uh, the standard for TIA 968 and Industry Canada, although there are requirements for those uh, units as well. Okay, so the previous slide we had a table showing the actual values, the power spectral densities uh, across 100 ohms uh, in the case of the ADSL and uh, ADSL2, but uh, here we're seeing the graphical representation of that uh, PSD. Um, and VDSL, so th this, these again are just examples of some of uh, what's in the document, but there are more, uh, depending on the type of DSL equipment you'd have, HDSL, SHDSL, uh, what have you, there are different uh, power spectral density uh, limits and, uh, and charts that would need to be met. Okay, and with that, I'll go ahead and uh, pass uh, the speaking portion of the presentation over to Camilo Urbana and he can pick up where the uh, optical GR253 core comes in. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, my name is Camilo Ben. I'm the EMC Technical Manager for Union City, California. Um, what I'll be talking about is the US, is the optical portion of the uh, GR253 and also going to some of the um, international standards for T1, for E1 D, uh, and the other rates. Um, for that. So GR253 is the standard used for optical devices uh, interfaces. Um, so you have your OC3 rates all the way up to OC7068. Um, this is more of a level one, I mean, excuse me, physical layer type testing. And also we get into some of the layer two and three um, tests. So some of the, the tests outlined in GR253 core is the eye diagram. You want to make sure that the eye of the actual rate meets within the mask. Uh, you want the extinction ratio where you're measuring the, the ratio of the eye. Um, you're looking at the, the accuracy of the clock within that specific rate that you're testing to. Um, jitter, uh, wander how much wander your frequency wanders or drifts when connected to a clock source. Um, how much jitter is actually can be tolerated by your equipment? Um, how much jitter is being transferred from your equipment from your TX side? Um, the alarms, what kind of alarms are being generated? And if those alarms are being properly registered into your J bytes or your K bytes of the software? Um, output power, how much power your interface is going through? Is your your excuse me your interface is putting out? Um, how sensitive? Is it to uh, noise or, or disturbances and attenuation? How how much attenuation can 
um, be handled by your interface. Next. Um, some of the common failures of this uh, testing is uh, the eye diagram and extinction ratio don't meet the mask, meaning that the eye of the interface um, does not meet, it's not contained within a certain um, mass per the rate. Um, the clocking source drifts beyond spec, uh, meaning that your clock um, exceeds the allowable tolerance within the uh, standard. Basically, if, uh, the, the jitter from the EUT exceeds operable limits, um, and the clock source of the EUT has a drift uh, when measured with a 24-hour period that does not exceed, that, that does exceed the limits. Or the EUT cannot handle the, the minimum amount of jitter being, being ejected to the EUT. Next. Some of the, most, all these fixes can be, are really um, software and firmware controlled. So if you have a failure with any, uh, any of these, um, any of those, those, those tests or failures, it can be easily fixed by either a software update or firmware adjustment. Next. So this is the eye diagram. Um, I'm just showing you a quick diagram for OC3 through OC12. So when I stated earlier the eye diagram mask, uh, this is the mask which the eye of the um, rate should um, not exceed. Next. These are some of the uh, attenuations. So basically, the amount of attenuation the EUT can handle, for example, let's say uh, OC3 interface at a 1310 nanometer, should be able to handle 7 dB attenuation for, that's approximately uh, 12 kiloliters. Um, and then you have your different rates and your different um, wavelengths, and based on that, um, you have different uh, attenuations that it must comply with. Next. This is basically the optical parameters. So each rate has to meet the specified parameters for that wavelength. So if you have, for example, a OC3, OC12, or OC48, whichever one that you, your product contain, uh, contains, um, it has to meet certain parameters. So for example, the parameter of the uh, wavelength, if we, when we measure the, the wavelength through, a, uh, through an analyzer, the wavelength has to be between 1260 nanometers to 1360 nanometers. It could be anywhere between that, that range. Um, the attenuation has to be tolerate all the way up to a 7 dB attenuation. Next. Uh, this is just basically the time deviation of the OCN port. So basically this is what we do for Wander. So we're measuring the deviation of the out from the clock output um, over a 24 hour period. Next. Uh, these are just a table of the values of that waveform. So you have your input deviation, your output deviation. So based on that um, your values should not exceed the mask that's given in the previous slide. Next. This is the jitter transfer limit for the uh, for the optical. So basically between, say for example, uh, OC3 rate, you have certain amount of limits that your ET could transfer. So if you have an OC3, then from 1.3 kilohertz to 130 kilo, 130 kilohertz. Um, the EUT should not be more, should not transfer more than 0.1 dB of power. Next, uh, this is the tolerance mask. Um, basically, this test is measuring the um, tolerance of the interface being subjected to test. Um, so this is giving you the limits of how much jitter we're actually to be applied and how much can be tolerated. So, for example, let's say OC12, um, you have you have, for example, from F0 to to F2, from 10 hertz to 
the limit should be 27.8. So basically, you should have 27.8 UIPP of power of uh, tolerance power being ejected without it being taller, without it affecting the UT. Next. This is the jitter generation limits. So basically this test, we're, make, we're, we're verifying how much jitter is being transmitted from the EUT with, uh, with the applied clock source. So what we're doing is we're measuring the, the transmission uh, of that jitter. So for example of, uh, let's say, LC48, so we set our, our filters from K12 kilohertz to 20 megahertz. And so the, the maximum amount of jitter that we can generate is 0.1 UIPP or and 0.01 UI RMS. Next. This is getting to now the international testing. Um, so the, the list of the test standards are for the international market. You have your Etsy 203021 uh, that covers your analog telecom equipment ports. You have your TBR 12 and 13 that covers your E1 digital equipment. You have your ACIF SO16, which is the Australia SO16, um, contains testing for E1 up to E4. You have your TNA117, which is a New Zealand requirement um, that has requirements for E1 interfaces up to E4 digital. It's a digital vendor. And then what Jim discussed earlier, you have your ITUT K20, K21, 44, 45. Next. Um, you also have your Hong Kong 2028 for T1 digital equipment. This is uh, tested for Hong Kong. And then you have your, uh, also you have your ADSL, VDSL equivalent for Europe, which is your ITUT um, G992.1 for ADSL, G993.1 for VDSL. And then ITUT G.703, which is for your Europe for uh, E1 through E4 digital equipment. Most of the um, international standards uh, follow the ITUT G.703 uh, test parameters. You also have your TBR24 for um, digital equipment. Um, your ITUT G707, um, G824, G957 are um, Basically, guidelines for your clocking, um, 277 is how to perform tests, 957 have some deviation, timing, and other requirements in there. Next. Okay, so now we're getting into the, to the, to the international standards um, for analog TE, which uh, for your Etsy ES203021, which uh, is analog stick for your pots, you have certain tests, it's like your DC unbalanced earth, your DC resistance, how much power are you sending within a 10 kilohertz bandwidth, um, DTMF, basically how much um, when you're, you're doing your low frequency and your high frequency to create a digit, how much power is being generated from that, um, DC current, how much is DC current being provided on the line, and then you have your combinations of different frequencies, how much difference are they to create that digit. Next. So common failures of this is uh, you have the impedance of unbalanced girds is seen to limit. So that's basically kind of like what Jim discussed for the longitudinal balance. It's kind of the same thing, um, but it has a different uh, values for Europe and different resistors. resistors. Um, some of your impedances between chip and ring are less than 4 megs when measured using the, the specified voltages of the EUT. Um, the output power sending limit exceeds the values. And uh, the power of the DT or signal exceeds limit. So you're, you're, when you measure that power of that digit being pressed, um, it has to be within a certain dB. And sometimes that power exceeds that. Um, the DC current during ringing um, tested with different at 25 hertz and 50 hertz, uh, and at 60 volt, they're they're exceeding limits. Uh, based on the frequency, the frequency combinations. Um, uh, for the DTMF image, high and low frequency um, are, do not meet the uh, frequency limits of the standard. Uh, some of the fixes are to adjust some of the impedances of the circuitry, um, modified chops, uh, chipset for software, 
or the registry. Um, adjust some of the internal impedances of the circuitry. Uh, like I said earlier, modify some of the chipset registers. So the, some of these are repeated, um, but they're pretty much uh, simple fixes. Next. So this is actually just a graph of of the unbalanced limits. Um, so the chart. So basically, the 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 limit has to exceed, um, for example, 50 hertz to 600 hertz. The the measurement has to exceed 40 dB, and then from 600 hertz frequency and above to 3400 hertz, it has to exceed 46 dB. So it's kind of like a longitudinal balance that's performed under ACTA. Um, analog TE setting level. Uh, basically, this is the um, measurement of being, of sending the actual limit. So the um, the hertz when you when you're the bandwidth of sending of signals or 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 within the pots line has to be less within the 10 hertz bandwidth has to be less within the the limits of the sending level. Next. Uh, this is uh, the frequency combinations when I discussed earlier about the combinations of frequencies. So to create a digit, these are the, uh, the frequencies of the combination. So when you're measuring the high and low frequency, you have to be on a, you have to, you can't drift too much from what the low group and the high group says. It has to be kind of within that number to create that digit because they don't want the digits to, to the, the frequencies to drift, to drift that far. Um, the next section is the, uh, what we're talking about is the digital portion of the international testing. So this contains the E1, E3, uh, ISD, and E4. Um, there's, there's certain, since all these tests are pretty much similar um, for TBR13, SO16, TNA117, Hong Kong 2028, um, GL73, TBR24, TBR304. Um, they're all pretty much similar testing. Um, your waveform verification. Um, basically, you're measuring the um, mask of the waveform for that E1 interface at 2048 kilohertz, making sure it meets the uh, the diagram. Um, jitter, um, same thing. You're making sure uh, what kind of jitter is being applied, how much jitter is being generated from the transmission line from the TX side, um, how much jitter is being transferred um, to the support equipment from the transmission line. Uh, return loss, how much, how much loss is being applied um, to the cable, your clock accuracy, um, how accurate is your clock, um, the frame structure, basically the framing of the um, interface of when it's doing packets, and then for ISD you're doing your layer, layer 2, level, layer 3 verification, uh, making sure that the handshaking, the communications between the devices um, that your product needs that specification. Uh, most of the common failures, you know, your pulse exceeds the limits of the mask. Um, the jitter exceeds the EUT limits. Um, EUT generates too much jitter for some of the tests. Clock accuracy, the clock is not accurate. It's drifting too far within a 24-hour period. Um, most common fixes, like I said, is just basically to update the firmware software to comply with the testing. And then for the jitter um, setting, to, and if it exceeds the amount of jitter, um, you could change the register of the jitter iterator. Um, usually, my experience is that when it fails the jitter testing, the, the firmware has it turned off, so uh, the customer will have to go in there and turn that register on. And once they turn on the register, it, it, it's fine. Next. Uh, this is an example of a, a E1 pulse mask at 2048. Um, so when you do the testing, you want to make sure that that mask, that that pulse fits within the mask. So you're looking at uh, a single pulse um, going through. Uh, next is the input digital output jitter, uh, jitter measurement. So this is where you're actually measuring uh, the jitter, make sure it's within the the, the graph. Next. Analog testing for international pots. Um, this is actually kind of similar to the ACTA, uh, where you're measuring the PSD, 
uh, power within one work study window, the power level, the output characteristics of the DSL interface, and the electrical characteristics. Next. Um, so some of the common failures of those that the pulse does it, you're, you're, when you're looking at the, the diagram of the DSL pulse, it doesn't meet the mask or the power within the 100 megahertz bandwidth window exceeds limits or the aggregated power exceeds limits. And most of these can be fixed with updated software and firmware. Next. Uh, this is some of the, the masks for the ATC, which is uh, ATC is the CL side of the PSD, the PSD mass pulse spectrum density. And so when you make your, when you look at the, the mask and you apply the output full power pulse, you want to make sure that the pulse is within the uh, diagram. Next. This is for ATR mask. And the same thing, so this is like a remote mask for remote connection, like a CL side. I mean, a remote side, like a home or something on the ASDA modem. And when you look at that, you want to see that the pulse is within the mask also. Next. Uh, these are actually the um, limits um, and how the impedance measurements and the bandwidth setups and how everything is measured within the mask. Next. This is a pulse mask for uh, VDSL. And once again, when you do VDSL, you want to make sure that it falls within the characteristics of the mask. Um, optical for the European side, ITT T707, GA24, G57. These are actually similar to uh, the uh, Sonic, but there are some deviations because you're dealing with Europe, which is 2048, so most of the time you're applying the clock source at 2048 kilohertz, uh, megahertz. Um, so basically in this, you have your frame structure, alarms, your output clock, your jitter generation, so you're, you're measuring the jitter generation, your jitter transfer, um, your wander, um, your mask, your things to ratio. Some of the limits are different from the GR253, um, but it's the same sort of testing with different limits. Next, uh, like it's, like we talked about earlier, some of the common failures are that the optical frame does not meet the requirements. The ET does not initiate proper alarm statuses, um, so it does the same. It doesn't change the status. If I if I inject the alarm, it, the alarm it doesn't change any of the uh, the bytes to indicate the alarm or the alarm doesn't generate at all. Don't, it just goes, the air just passes through the system. The internal clock uh, drifts more than 50 ppm, meaning your clock accuracy is not correct. Um, the iter generates a lot of jitter. Uh, this is the, uh, STM. This is basically um, the diagram for that STM optical interface. So these are the limits for certain uh, wavelengths. Next. This is the eye diagram for the eye pattern for OC, for, for OC, uh, excuse me, STM1. Next. This is the wander limit for 204 kilobits interface. This is the limit that uh, the EUT cannot exceed over 24-hour period drift. Next. Uh, this is the amount of jitter that can be handled uh, for the certain um, STM interfaces and you have your frequencies and your limits. Next, the input jitter of the tolerance. You have a tolerance. Next. And that's it. Good. Thank you, Camillo. That includes, that concludes the presentation portion of this webinar. A copy of the webinar will be available on metlabs.com. We will send a follow-up email with a link to this file. Now we will answer questions. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your control panel. For questions we can easily address now, we will read the question aloud, then give the answer. Please give us a, a, about 30 seconds to get oriented here. <clears throat> 
Okay, this is uh, Jim. There is a question about uh, the GR1089 uh, ports type 4 or 4A, and I believe the question has to do with the AC power faults and, and why uh, are there AC power faults. Well, again, just to refresh, the, the type 4 or 4A uh, type of port is a port that is an intra-building port, so it does not leave the confines of the building and it's located at the uh, customer premise side of the network. And there are uh, power fault, uh, there is a power fault test, an AC power fault, again, simulating that commercial power coming in contact with these tele telecom ports or Ethernet ports that are performed for type 4 or 4A uh, ports. And it's not the case with the similar type 2 Port where type 2 is located at the central office. And I believe that the, uh, the mindset there, the idea is that if you're at the customer premise location, it's, in, it's not a controlled environment. For the most part, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, it could be in a telephone closet in the, in the building uh, where you have your access points, your, your power and your telecom uh, services coming into that building. Uh, it's located at the customer premise, so it's not, you know, in a Verizon central office, for example, or an AT&T office. So it's not a controlled environment as, it, as the equipment would be if it were placed into those uh, utilities-owned properties. And so the mindset there is that there could potentially be some sort of fault uh, or situation where uh, 120 uh, volt RMS comes in contact with uh, the telecom port. So that it's very limited testing, uh, but there are uh, uh, a couple of AC power faults that are uh, that are applied to those uh, type four, type four A ports, and that's really the reasoning there. Okay, there's a, another question. Uh, does the uh, GR1089 contain any uh, power spectral density tests? And the answer to that is no. Uh, there are no, uh, generally speaking, there are no performance tests in the GR1089 specification. Uh, although the equipment is configured and running traffic properly uh, at, at full uh, capacity during the, the course of the test, uh, it's really not a performance set of criteria. It's more about uh, survivability of the equipment and uh, in the event of those uh, surge tests and uh, power fault tests, <coughs> as well as criteria for bonding and grounding or, you know, earth grounding of the equipment. Uh, but it's more perf uh, not performance related, but more electrical safety uh, and fire hazard type uh, criteria there. So no, there, there are no performance tests, power spectral density tests for any DSL ports uh, for the GR1089 set of criteria. So there's a question about do you think